Welcome to CUNY Laureates, the show about CUNY graduates who went on to win high scores in their respective fields. On this episode, we profile another two Nobel Prize winning graduates from the City University of New York. First, Gertrude Elion faces tragedy and finds purpose in her quest to cure cancer and other diseases through rational drug design. Robert Ullman becomes embroiled in the high-stakes world of war and peace with his groundbreaking contributions to game theory. And producer Craig Thompson highlights the recent donation of Gertrude Elion's Nobel Prize to Hunter College with a look back at the school's history and its impact on generations of women. Throughout most of history, practicing medicine was largely a matter of trial and error. Try a bunch of things from nature, throw out what doesn't work, and hold on to what does. Over long periods of time, medicines would get whittled down to a few substances that could treat diseases pretty well, but it wasn't exactly efficient and could sometimes have some very unfortunate consequences. Eventually, the search for medicines moved out of the natural world and into the laboratory. But even as recently as the 20th century, the strategy was largely the same, trial and error. Most of our common illnesses today already have a prescription. But what if you had some new disease and your doctor just told you to try a bunch of different medicines until you felt better? You'd probably be a little annoyed, right? Nervous even? Thankfully, scientists now have some new tools to find the medicine you need before it goes into your body or anyone else's. This is the story of a CUNY graduate who became a Nobel laureate on the development of rational drug design. It was a very cold winter night in 1918 when Gertrude Ellen was born. So cold, in fact, that the pipes in their Manhattan apartment froze and burst. Luckily, it was a rare discomfort for the relatively well-off family. Gertrude's father, Robert, had emigrated from Lithuania to the U.S., where he graduated from NYU School of Dentistry and subsequently opened a business. Her mother, Bertha, from modern-day Poland, had not received an education herself, but understood the importance of one, and she wanted Gertrude to have a career. However, when the time came for Gertrude to go to college, the family's fortunes had changed. Robert had invested a great deal in the stock market, and although he managed to keep his business, the crash of 1929 meant there was no money to spend on tuition. Luckily for Gertrude, there was a college that didn't ask for any. Had it not been that Hunter College was a free college, she later wrote in her Nobel autobiography, I suspect I might never have received a higher education. With the problem of cost now behind her, Gertrude's only dilemma was what to study. Ultimately, it was a personal loss that helped her decide. Her grandfather had recently passed away from stomach cancer, and she had been by his side in the hospital until the end. The experience moved her deeply, and she decided she was going to do something about cancer. Pursuing a career in the development of new drugs, she majored in chemistry at Hunter College and graduated in 1937. Gertrude was eager to find work doing research, but found doors close to her. You're qualified, she recalled being told, but we've never had a woman in the laboratory before, and we think you'd be a distracting influence. Instead, she continued her education at NYU, which she paid for by working as a substitute teacher and doctor's receptionist. She also met the love of her life, Leonard Cantor, a brilliant young statistician from City College, who had the highest GPA in the school's history. The two connected over a shared love of concerts and theater and over long conversations about science and were soon engaged to marry. But in 1941, tragedy struck. Leonard contracted a heart infection and died after battling the disease for more than six months. Witnessing yet another loved one pass away made Gertrude more determined than ever to spend her life fighting diseases. She never remarried, and threw herself into her work. In 
After receiving her master's degree in chemistry, Gertrude was finally able to find a job in a laboratory. But it wasn't doing research. Instead, she worked in quality control for the grocery chain A&P, testing the acidity of pickles and the color of mayonnaise. The job gave her valuable experience with lab equipment, but she still hungered for real research. Looking for new opportunities, she came across a small research group in Tuckahoe, New York. The researchers there took turns interviewing applicants, and by chance, the scientist conducting interviews when Gertrude arrived was Dr. George Hitchings. George was greatly impressed with the young applicant and offered her an assistant position in his laboratory. Hitching's lab was focused on rational drug design, a radical idea that drugs could be developed more efficiently by understanding how cells and viruses reproduced. Hitchens hypothesized that scientists could find a rational way to interfere with the DNA replication process and, by doing so, prevent the growth of pathogen cells in the body. In order to accomplish this goal, Gertrude and her colleagues needed to take a closer look into the synthesis of DNA in disease-causing cells. In the next several years, Gertrude focused her work on purines, the chemical compounds that make up DNA. Her goal was twofold. First, she needed to develop a compound similar to purine, a kind of cuckoo egg of biochemical processes. By fooling a cell into accepting it as part of its genetic material, this imposter purine would then ruin the replication process of the DNA it had entered, thus stopping cellular growth. But not just any imposter purine would do. Gertrude's chemical candidate would need to interfere only with disease cells and not the healthy cells. If it interfered with both, then the medicine would, in the words of Francis Bacon, cure the disease and kill the patient. <coughs> Luckily for Gertrude, she and George had found that normal cells, cancer cells, and microbes all use the building blocks of DNA differently. In theory, it should be possible to target some cells and not others. After several years of research, Gertrude Styler's study of purines began to prove fruitful. In 1948, she and George discovered a compound called diaminopurine. The chemical inhibited the growth of certain bacteria and leukemia cells, but still had some toxic side effects in patients. None of the less encouraged. Gertrude continued her dive into purines and in 1951 made a breakthrough. Six mercaptopurine was a chemical that attacked leukemia cells, but not healthy cells, meeting both requirements she and George were looking for in a drug. In collaboration with the Sloan Kettering Institute, the drug was rushed into production, and although its long-term efficacy was limited, one-third of all patients receiving it went into complete remission. But Gertrude didn't stop at leukemia. In 1957, by making a simple chemical alteration to six mercaptopurine, she and George developed another drug named azathioprine. The new drug was able to inhibit white blood cells that were rejecting organ transplants and has since allowed tens of thousands of patients to receive new organs. Over the succeeding decades, Gertrude's work led to the development of treatments for gout, malaria, and bacterial infections. It also led to the development of AZT, the first drug widely used in the fight against AIDS. But the final jewel of her career came in 1978 with the introduction of a cyclovir, a compound that came to be known as the first successful antiviral drug. Originally used for treatment of herpes, this medication heralded a new era of therapeutic medicines and eventually led to the development of antiviral drugs such as Paxlovid, the drug now commonly used for the treatment of COVID-19. Back in New York, as a young student entering Hunter College, Gertrude had decided she would do something about cancer. A few short decades later, she had indeed done something about it, as well as malaria, AIDS, and a whole host of other diseases, saving thousands of lives in the process. In 1988, Gertrude Ellian and George Hitchings were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their discoveries of important principles for drug treatment. Thanks to Gertrude Elion, medicine became a lot more than just rolling the dice. That should make us all feel better.
35 years after Gertrude Elion was awarded the Nobel Prize, the medal itself, as well as the dress she wore at the ceremony, was given to Hunter College. But to learn about what helped to lay the groundwork for Gertrude's education that eventually led to winning this Nobel Prize, we must go back into the archives of Hunter College. This is the, uh, the yearbook called the Wisterian. This is the 1935 Wisterian. The page that I've that it opened to actually is a good uh, example of the diversity of Hunter College. Hunter College started out as a normal school in 1870. Its founder, Thomas Hunter, a political asylum seeker from Ireland, came to New York with a strong sense of justice. After becoming a teacher and learning there were no free academies for girls in New York, he decided to establish one himself. He thought women should not just leave a classroom as young girls at 13, 14 and show up the next week as teachers that they deserve two years of content knowledge, a year of pedagogical training. Between 1870 and 1914, thousands of women attended this new academy in Manhattan. We have always been about empowering women, and we've always been about empowering women of all races, ethnic backgrounds, religions, creeds. So it's an extraordinary sense of engaging females and telling them they can do anything in the world. Philip Swan, the interim archivist of Hunter College, says that, unlike other schools at the time, the normal school is open to students from all backgrounds. Again, it's very unique in 1874. It's only, you know, uh, nine years after the Civil War ended. So this is a very progressive idea at the time. A photo from 1884, so it's soon after Hunter was founded. By 1914, with the school still in the same building on Park Avenue, the name had been changed to Hunter College, but the mission stayed unchanged. As the Great Depression was underway, many, including the future Nobel laureates Gertrude Elion and Rosalind Yellow, came to Hunter College because it was free. In the 1920s, uh, Hunter was, had the largest enrollment of women in a, a city university in the country, not in just New York City, but in the entire United States. In the 1930s, obviously, we had the Great Depression, and people were impoverished, and uh, going to college probably wasn't a high priority for a lot of people because they were just trying to find jobs and food and taking care of their families. So for people like Gertrude Elian, uh, it was a great opportunity to get a college education for free. By the mid-1930s, enrollment had continued to expand including the year that Gertrude graduated. She was one of 75 chemistry majors graduating in 1937. That would have been unheard of. But what she got at Hunter was that sense that she could do anything, that she was prepared, that she was very smart, and that it was really okay to be a very smart woman. Another key factor was that, true to its identity, Hunter College was open to anyone, regardless of race or religious affiliation. So it was certainly a large body uh, of Jewish students because, uh, you know, many student, Jewish students, unfortunately, were barred from, from different schools, whether uh, overtly or more subtly. So I think uh, that would be, you know, a, a big draw. So I think naturally you'd have uh, 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 Jewish students applying here. Her nephew, John Elion, agrees. Hunter was a very good match. She was um, a Jewish woman. And while there was nothing in the bylaws of Hunter College that addressed that, there was a long-standing tradition of women, first of all, and then Jewish women coming here. She was not bothered by differences in gender, in religion, in race, in sexual orientation. Um, she had a very egalitarian view of the world and of the people that worked with her. And that began at Hunter. Um, that is ingrained in the culture here. Um, and that's something that really was with her for her entire life. Moving ahead in time, Hunter College expanded into all of the other boroughs. During the Second World War, 95,000 women were trained for military service at the Bronx campus under the WAVES and SPARS programs. By 1964, Hunter was co-ed, and in 1969, the school began offering Black and Puerto Rican studies, one of the first of its kind in the country. And then, the open admissions policy of CUNY even further expanded the ethnic makeup of Hunter College, which holds true to the current day. The, the latest stats I've seen is that three quarters of the student body at Hunter are still female. So it's still primarily a women's school. A lot of them are first generation college students. Uh, they're 
parents, um, you know, a lot of them are recent immigrants. So, uh, and, and getting back to the Thomas Hunter idea of immigration, the idea of, of making opportunities available to people who might not have that elsewhere, really lives on. I think he'd be very happy to see what the college is doing for, for New York City today. Today's immigrants look different. They're from different countries, different religions, different backgrounds. It's that same story of the first generation college goer, the student who could not otherwise go to college but for Hunter College and we are here to support them and give them the path to success. Gertrude Elion's blue gown now hangs in the Hunter College archives. Soon, however, it will be displayed along with other valuable artifacts from her private collection in the Hunter College library, a powerful symbol of her success story and the core values that Hunter College has always stood for. Imagine for a moment that you're commanding an air defense regiment in some nameless war when the unthinkable happens. A squadron of enemy bombers heads for your location equipped with atomic bombs. Intelligence reports inform you that most of the planes heading your way are decoys, with only a few carrying the nuclear payload. So who do you order your soldiers to shoot down first? You could start with the planes in the front, since they'll be the first to reach your location, but surely the enemy must realize that those planes would be vulnerable and will have placed the bombs further back. Do you shoot down the planes in equal measure across the entire squadron? Or has the enemy anticipated that strategy and grouped the bombs together while you spread your focus elsewhere? The minutes are dwindling and your soldiers are waiting. What are your orders? Thankfully, this hypothetical was only a simulation conceived during the Cold War, a scenario not unlike the ones played out in thousands of video games across the world each day. But it begs a deadly serious question. Can warfare be conducted rationally? And if so, can it be deterred rationally as well? Or are those questions too dangerous even to ask? This is the story of a CUNY graduate who became a Nobel laureate in his groundbreaking work on game theory. From his earliest years, Robert Aumann was already painfully familiar with conflict and cruelty. Born in Germany in 1930, Robert spent the first eight years of his life as a Jew, face to face with the increasingly deadly anti-Semitism of the Nazis. Fearing the horrors to come, his parents managed to secure a visa to the United States, but it meant leaving all of their money behind, and in 1938, Robert and his family arrived in New York nearly penniless. Robert began attending Jewish parochial schools in the Lower East Side and in Borough Park where the family lived. It was in high school where a teacher introduced him to the subject that he would fall in love with, mathematics. And so when it came time to attend college, Robert knew what his focus would be. What he didn't know, however, was how he was going to afford it. It was the tuition-free city college that put that question to rest. With no fees to pay, Robert was able to hold down a job and begin saving money while continuing his studies. City College provided a multidisciplinary education and Robert took classes in a wide range of fields, including biology, philosophy, literature, music, and film. But Robert's love of math never faltered and while at City College, he studied under the famous research mathematician, Emil Post. Robert was drawn to so-called pure math. These were mathematic disciplines that were seen as entirely intellectual and without practical applications, or, as Robert would later put it, absolutely useless. In 1950, Robert graduated from City College and attended MIT, where he continued his studies into pure math, this time the theory of mathematical knots. But it was also at MIT where Robert first met John Nash, the famous mathematician and subject of the 1998 film A Beautiful Mind. Nash introduced Robert to game theory, 
the mathematical study of strategic interactions between individuals or groups. As an applied or impure form of mathematics, it held little interest to Robert, and he didn't give it much thought. But after receiving his PhD and beginning postdoctoral work at Princeton, Robert was assigned the Atomic Squadron problem, that hypothetical war game concerning bombers and decoys. Bell Labs had been developing a surface-to-air missile for the U.S. military and wanted to know what strategies would be most useful in repelling a nuclear strike. Robert realized that game theory could be just the right approach to the problem and after completing his report, began to take it very seriously. In 1956, Robert and his wife Esther moved to the new nation of Israel, where he began teaching at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. The math department at Hebrew University did not look down on applied mathematics the way other schools had at the time. And there, Robert felt free to pursue his newfound interest in game theory. His focus was on repeated games and the theory that a single scenario which does not produce cooperation between parties might produce cooperation in the long run if repeated enough times. In his Nobel lecture, Robert gave the following example. Rowena and Colin are playing a game. Rowena is given two choices. She can either give 10 coins to both herself and Colin, or she can receive 100 coins and give Colin only one. Colin also has two choices. He can either cancel Rowena's transaction, regardless of what it is, or he can allow it. In such a scenario, Rowena has no incentive to share. She knows that Colin won't cancel, since receiving one coin will still be better for him than receiving zero. So each person's self-interest results in a big win for Rowena. But if the game is repeated indefinitely, a funny thing happens. Colin can threaten to cancel the next transaction if Rowena only gives him one coin. In fact, Colin could keep canceling transactions until Rowena loses more than she would have otherwise gained. In this repeating game, it is in each person's self-interest to always share, a scenario known as strategic equilibrium. This deceptively simple example illustrated a groundbreaking advancement in game theory. His decades-long work on the subject was much more complicated, involving games with different rules, different numbers of players, or incomplete information, and invoking terminology like strong equilibrium, perfect equilibrium, or bargaining sets. But at their most fundamental, Robert had shown that repeated interactions can result in cooperation even when single interactions do not. Despite starting out as a young math student repelled by applicability, Robert's work in game theory quickly found some very serious and very controversial applications. At the height of the Cold War in the 1960s, Robert and other mathematicians were asked by the United States Arms Control and Disarmament Agency to work on game theory problems that could help inform negotiations with the Soviet Union. And when Robert and fellow game theorist Thomas Schelling were announced as Nobel Prize winners in 2005, Controversy followed even there. A group of nearly 1,000 intellectuals and activists from the U.S., Israel, and other countries signed a petition opposing the prize. They objected to how Robert and Thomas had used their work, including an interview in which Robert used game theory to criticize the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. It was a rare case of opposition to a Nobel Prize in science. In response, the Swedish Academy, which awards the prize, stated that it makes its decisions based only on the quality of the scientific contribution and declined to reverse its decision. War was no mere abstraction for Robert, however. In 1982, his eldest son Shlomo had been killed fighting as a tank gunner in the Lebanon War, a profound loss that brought the issue into painfully sharp focus, both professionally and personally. In his Nobel lecture entitled War and Peace, Robert argued passionately that war is indeed a rational act, a decision based on measurable incentives and disincentives. He claimed that only by studying those incentives can war be avoided. Any other approach would be doomed to fail. In 2005, Robert Allman was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for enhancing the understanding of conflict and cooperation through game theory analysis. Robert Allman's advancements in game theory were so controversial precisely because they were so consequential. 
and showing that long-term interactions can be studied mathematically, he suggested a scientific approach to confronting problems as grave and cruel as war. But how can we ethically determine incentives and disincentives when lives are at stake? Robert demonstrated a promising way to approach one of humanity's oldest problems, but in doing so, he also showed that game theory in the hands of the powerful is anything but a game.